questions. Now we'll shift our gears and talk about the overall things that the clinicians and to some extent the radiologists are also supposed to be aware of. These will be what is the presentation of tumors and what are the causes of tumors, what are the predisposing factors of tumors, how we approach tumors, how we treat them and what are the outcomes of the treatment and what we are supposed to look at it. So these are the things that overall as such is it is an idiopathic thing but these are the things that are associated with increased risk of brain tumors that will be exposure to vinyl chloride e epstein barr virus and these are the syndromes like nf1 one and uh, tuber sclerosis and this thing i don't even know how to pronounce it uh, and turkle syndrome and uh, basal cell carcinoma syndrome so these are the syndromes that will predispose those patients will have a higher incidence of tumors they have these genetic changes you would think of all the white matter changes to be less or likely high hematomas and uh, more likely to be uh, predisposing higher incidence of tumors and that. So how do they present? The, mainly the presentation, what typical I have seen of the patients, they generally come in with the chronic headache, visual changes, or seizure the first presentation of seizure they come to the emergency room and then we find out that there's underlying brain disease on mr it turns out to be brain tumor uh, but the presentation will be to a great extent depend on where the tumor is located so if it is in the frontal lobe the heel kind of present with the frontal lobe syndrome if it is close to the sylvian fissure it will present with the speech changes if it is in the occipital lobe it will present the visual changes if it is in the parietal region frontal parietal adjacent the motor cortex he'll have uh, sensory or motor abnormalities so these depend and if it is in the brainstem it will present with brainstem symptoms posterior fossa tends to be presenting sooner than later the supratentorial tends to present with seizures infratentorial does not tend to present with seizures so those are the things depending on what kind of tumor how aggressive it is and what is the location of it and by the time it is presenting what is the size of it and how much of mass effect it is causing those are the things that decide its presentation. But by far, we talked about the location having those uh, typical symptoms and presentation. They present with headache, nausea, vomiting, and vision, speech, uh, hearing changes, or seizures. These are the most, most common presentations that a tumor will present. With. Uh, next, what do we do with these? How do we diagnose them? So the basic thing for WHO classification would be the histology or the electron or light microscopy. That would be the first step of uh, classifying that. And after that, for the nomenclature, the second step would be to do immunohistochemistry, cytogenic and genetic analysis and name that as the second part of the tumor name. So we talked about putting in the IDH, mutant or not mutant. We talked about TERT. We talked about uh, RELA status. We talked about P53 status. We talked about MGMT status. We talked about co deletion. So, those are the nomenclatures that you will add to it. That will you'll get by genetic and genetic analysis and immunohistochemistry. So, these are the tests that you will be doing in the brain tissue. So, what are the factors that affect the overall prognosis of the tumor? Most important thing is where is the tumor located and what is its aggressiveness. So, if it, the tumor is uh, situated in a very, very important or eloquent area or say brainstem, it is almost that the patient cannot be treated because of that. Either the treatment will be more harmful than the cure, the patient will die or have a major motor deficit or some major functional deficit. So, it is it is very poor prognosis. The other thing is the grade of the tumor. The grade one is very good in response. The grade four is very poor in response. Then we talked about all the chromosomal markers. The IDH mutant is a good response. The codilated is a good response. The P53 increased expression is a good response. Uh, the TERT is a poor response. ATRX is a good response. So we talked about those, the genetic markers. They will be decided. Then after that, what? how much of tumor is left after surgery? If we could do surgery, if it was in an eloquent area and we could only do debulking, the tumor is still there. It will immediately recur. So that will be a poor prognosis. So all these things, these are characteristics of the brain tumor that decides. But on top of that, if the patient has a very good tumor, say in the frontal lobe, a low grade WHO1, IDH mutant, co-deleted oligodendroglioma in the frontal lobe, but the patient's health is miserable. He has uh, immunocompromised status. He, he has asthma. He has uh, uh, diabetes. He has cardiac disease. He has all possible illness. He has intestinal resection. He had Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis and whatever the patient's overall general health is poor it is almost as if it, he has got a death sentence you cannot treat in that patient uh, you cannot give him chemotherapy you cannot give him radiation therapy you cannot do he cannot undergo surgery his physical status so this this is one important thing that we tend to overlook that all of the things may be favorable as far as the tumor is concerned but his general health is poor then then the outcomes will be very poor 
Next, we move on to the staging system. For thank God, by love of God, we don't have a staging system in brain tumors. Otherwise, that would be another thing that we would have to know. So um, by far, there's no clear staging system. It is just the WHO staging system. And most of the time, in my 15 years of practice, I've only seen one tumor, like a GBM, going out of the brain and going into the brain, uh, bone, which was a very, very unusual uh, tumor. Otherwise, by far, they're localized into the CNS system. The most they can do is tumors like uh, medial blastomas and ependymomas, choroid plexus, papillary carcinomas. They can do is metastatize along the neural axis, but they tend to stay within the CNS. So that is by far the classification of the staging. So that is all we have to cover. We really don't have to do a general body PET scan or look for metastasis here and there from brain tumors. Then uh, what are the factors that we take into account to treat tumors? Again, it is, we talked about that, the histology, one through four classification, that is the th thing that is uh, deciding how the outcome is, how the treatment will be based. The second is genotype of the cell. So the main WHO classification, the first histology, the second it being the genetic code of that tumor. Those are the two main things that decide how the treatment will be based, how the outcomes will be, how we will treat it after surgery and treatment, how the tumor will response and the other things that decide is where the tumor is located in the brain how much uh, close it is to eloquent area and how much of the cancer is left after surgery so those are the things that uh, also matter uh, how the outcome post-treatment so what do we use for treatment one is surgery second is radiation therapy that can be focal radiation therapy like radio surgery or imrt or it can be a total brain radiation if the tumor is spread over a very large area then we have chemotherapy then we have immunomodulation immunotherapy targeted therapy those are the things that we use so we will just briefly go through that surgery is again as any surgery anywhere you see something abnormal you take it out if you cannot take it out stick it somewhere close by that is the principle that has been for surgery whether it is abdominal chest or brain surgery that is the same concept the only thing in brain tumor you have to be careful of is you have to make sure that you are not affecting the eloquent areas of the brain the important areas important white matter tracts these are not affected and we do few tests of that uh, to make sure that these parts are not affected and i will just go through briefly at, by the at the end of this uh, lecture for that the other things that we talk about is the chemotherapy. So there are different chemotherapy agents. There are kinase inhibitors which stop cancer cells from reproducing and decreases their blood supply. Then there are the VGF inhibitors or vascular endothelial growth factor which promotes tumorigenesis or increases the blood supply and the nutrition to the tumor. You have agents that suppress the blood vessels that feed the tumors and their permeability. So the, the Avastin being the one that is most common, but this is associated with a false sense of safety. Uh, but it, this is one of the most commonly used drugs also at the same time. Then you have alkylating agents, uh, uh, which adds methyl groups and stops the DNA from replicating and cells from replicating. Then you can have uh, temozolomide, which is DNA replication inhibitor. And then you can use combination of that, which the most common being PCV or procarbazine, hydrochloride, lomastine, and mincristine. These are a bunch of alkylating agents, basically adding methyl groups and preventing DNA replication and therefore preventing the tumorogenesis of that or the decreasing the growth of the tumor. So these in combinations are separately, but by far the names that you'll hear most would be Evastin, Temzolamide, Lomastin, and uh, Procarpazine. These are the names that you will most frequently hear from the oncologists. And the way they act is, we talked about this isolating agent at methyl group. So this depends on the MGMT, the promoter gene, hypermethylated or unmethylated, whether the DNA will be able to respond. So again, do these don't matter? Uh, by and large, when we look at the images of the radiology, they don't matter. But when we are talking about how to treat the patient, when there's an interdisciplinary conference and the neurosurgeon and the neuro-oncologist is breathing down your neck and there are 20 people sitting in the same room and they ask you, is this a recurrent tumor? Am I supposed to go in and do surgery? Is this pseudo progression? Is this pseudo response? That is the time you're supposed to take all the information. You find out what was the tumor agent that was uh, given to that for treatment. What was the patient? Uh, genetic code, what was the tumor associated? So you give a patient alkylating agents, a temzolamide. Uh, you gave a patient who was uh, unmethylated. Now that's not going to affect that patient. So you see changes in the brain after surgery and after treatment. Chances are this is a recurrent tumor. Whereas you gave temzolamide to then a uh, hypermethylated patient, chances are you completely treated that, suppress the tumor, and immediately in the near future post treatment, if there are any changes in the surrounding brain 
parenchyma, that's more likely to be tumor treatment related rather than recurrent tumor and you would hold back with an aggressive approach. So that is why we are supposed to know what chemotherapy, how it acts and what is the genetic code. Tumor. So this is a patient who was given chemotherapy. So this was a brain tumor which initially showed some progression, but later on uh, involuted. And there's very little bisex surrounding white matter changes again, as opposed to what you would see with radiation. Uh, next is you can use targeted therapy and into this falls that Evastin where you're specifically going after factors that help tumor growth or something that is helping the two cells multiply and or then you suppress that factor. So we, or you can go after specific antibodies or the receptors of the cell. Those are the things that you can do. And most common that you use for this is Evastin where this is prevents the VEGF or vascular endothelial growth factor, which, which basically prevents new vascularity, reduces the effectiveness of gap junctions, and creates fenestration and endothelium of existing brain capillaries. So all in all, when you give the Evastin, it looks as if you have involuted the tumor, the whole tumor just disappears. But it is a very, very false sense of safety that you're getting with this VGF. You have to monitor this very, very closely. Uh, there are a few downsides, the most important being the pseudo response that you feel a false sense of response that the patient is involuting, whereas it is actually not. Uh, then the other thing is a patient who has already had hemorrhage is not a candidate for this. And the patient uh, perfusion imaging becomes kind of unreliable in patients who have received a, uh, Avastin or VEGF uh, inhibitors. Um, and as such, perfusion is generally uh, very unreliable in patients who have had uh, hemorrhage in the past. So these are the downsides of giving Evastin to the patient. And then also, once you start the patient on Evastin, they get thrown out of a lot of clinical trials. Um, so that is one th another issue that we encounter. Uh, they cannot get new research uh, medications. Uh, so this was a patient who was started on Evastin. You can see a GBM, which is intensely enhancing. This almost shows up it is, as it, it disappeared. The tumor disappeared and involuted. But actually, if you see, this was a pseudo response. The tumor was this before treatment, and it has progressed overall. So this was the issue issues that we run into. Done. Next is you can have immunomodulation where basically we understand that tumors are mainly be because of uh, uh, patients' immunity being suppressed. Uh, so you can either boost their immunity or restore their immunity by vaccines and those things. Those are the other things that you uh, we uh, are currently in mainly in research trial, but are being used at our institution uh, to uh, pain tumors. So this was a patient who was treated with immunotherapy and initially it progressed, but then later on it involuted the same thing with the enhancement the same with this over the period of time where you see the patient has overall to have a good response and then you of course you give supportive care where you give steroids to decrease brain edema their nausea vomiting headache all these things uh, respond with that and then you give them anti-epileptic uh, there are tests we talked about that should be done before any intervention to identify the eloquent areas the so one of them is uh, rather the most important of them is the functional MRI where we use the bold technique to see the areas that have increased oxygen supply or activation or during activation. Whenever brain does a function, there are two ways there is nutrition increase to that part of the brain. One is vasodilation and the second is increased extraction. So you, the blood vessel from here to here gets dilated and then there is increased number of oxygen that is extracted. But one of the things that is different is the vasodilation is significantly more than the amount of extraction. So this is a normal state where you are supplying four oxygen and two oxygen. This is the arterial side and this is the venous side where two oxygen are remaining because of two oxygen being extracted. Now you make the patient do a function. You supply vasodilation. It multiplies by five times. So you have 20 oxygen being supplied and only extraction does not increase the same uh, uh, amount. So say five, arbitrarily say five oxygen come out, you are left with 15 oxygen. Now, this is the ratio we want to do when you're doing the board technique or comparing the function and giving the um, red color to that area of activation. If you do it on the venous side, you have a ratio of 1 is to 5. I mean, on the arterial side, you'll have a ratio of 1 is to 5 approximately. And on the venous side, you end up with a higher ratio. So you want to see the comparison on the venous side. Uh, and that is the side you uh, calculate for. Uh, so this was a patient of oligodendroglioma, calcification, low-grade tumor, narrow zone of 
and we did a functional task where we did the motor and the language which consists of rhyming word generation and listening task and then this is the brain mr which we overlap with the function now here the motor task is distant from there now you need a gap of at least 5 mm to be completely safe during surgery whereas in language task there are, this is coming too close this is almost less than 5 mm and here it is almost overlapping on rhyming task so that he will if we take out a good margin a clear margin of the tumor resection he will end up with some deficit so these are the things where you only do debulking of the tumor so this is the issue that you run across later on is it completely resected this is what decides the progress of the tumor the second thing that we do is the diffusion tensor imaging now this is something in research this is not something billable this is not something that you can defend in court of law but this is frequently done to mark the white important white matter fibers where we use the diffusion technique like if you do it for diffusion technique you do it two dimensional for stroke where you see the random motion but all these of um, random motion of molecules of water but all these motion of molecules is finally directed along the white matter tracks so this is what you're calculating along the z axis also the third axis you are taking into account and then you color code it to identify which are these are the most important the arc arcuate fibers and the corticospinal tracks these are the most important tracks that you identify now what pictures we give these pictures that we give to the clinician have no importance they take this software the digital information feed into to their own uh, software during surgery which is what they use to decide whether how close to the the white matter fibers they are what how close to the arcuate or corticospinal tract fibers they are or visual tract they are to before uh, while they surgery then the other thing that we do is a uh, perfusion imaging now this is the same way what you use for uh, strokes you do the same calculation the four parameters the one we use for tumor is the area under the curve the cerebral blood volume so this is a tumor which is uh, within the frontoparietal lobe has enhancement so it's grade 3 or grade 4 by imaging uh, and uh, given its narrow zone of transition we can talk about the idh and all those things but really this is not what we will be talking about when we are giving out the diagnosis but what is we are talking about here is the perfusion uh, this intense elevated cbv in this tumor uh, uh, so this is a kind of an aggressive tumor and this is perfusion imaging is what you will look for even when you are confused between radiation necrosis versus a recurrent tumor um, the recurrent tumor will have elevated cbv as a physician we all know what to do to treat a patient but it is equally important for us to know what not to do to the patient because sometimes the cure can be more harmful than the disease itself so when should be not operate on a patient so if it is a low grade tumor with all the nice characteristics like idh mutant co deleted uh, trt negative atr expressions uh, increased expression of uh, p53 and mgmt hypermethylated all those things are present and it's located in the frontal neoplasm far away from any eloquent area not causing significant symptoms incidentally noted patient came in with heterotrauma and we first saw the neoplasm you don't need to operate that you don't unnecessarily need to go in so that you will not want to operate and then the flip side of that is if it is involving an important area eloquent area say completely involving the insular cortex or completely involving the motor cortex or the brain stem you operate one of those that you give him a debilitating condition that is not just not worth it you, he will live for 5 years with no complete uh, paralysis as opposed to you give him one year with complete uh, retention of function that is better so this is finally between the and the clinician to decide but those are the things where you do not operate then patients in overall poor health and poor compliance they those once you tend not to operate then uh, uh, if there is a, you change your treatment from all the aggressive surgery to radio surgery if there is less than 2 mm gap uh, from important structure so those are the things that you are want to keep in mind uh, for treatment talking to the neurosurgeon or the neuro oncologist you will hear these terms that oh i was doing the surgery and then I, i got i felt it was a bit too dangerous and i stopped at this point so and then you see there is a residual tumor so what made the surgeon stop at that point these are the things that these are the four things that they use uh, to decide when to stop we talked about functional imaging how close it is to the eloquent area if it is overlapping they debulk the tumor they don't take out the whole tumor so that they use then the dti not the images we give them the information that we give the digital information into their own software and then they decide on that how close the white matter tract is to that and accordingly they operate and the 
the other the two most important thing are these two where elect, there's an electrophysiologist actually in the surgery room where they are stimulating the white matter tract and looking for a response in the distributing muscle by emg or the other way around either side they can give a stimulus distally and see how it is uh, coming to the white matter tract that they're operating and this is where they know whether they're getting to a very important area and they start stop the surgery at that point uh, and lastly sometimes the patient is awake answering tasks uh, the questions doing tasks during surgery and that is what when they see something changing they stop at that point so these are the four or five things that the surgeon takes during the or to see how they can do for surgery um, lastly we will talk about what do we do for residual tumor we talked about how do we identify with the residual tumors with the genetic code of that patient what agent we use for treatment the things that we uh, talked about earlier but uh, immediately after surgery if there is some tumor left then you can either use new adjuvant chemotherapy or you can gamma knife that area or you can start him on research drugs clinical trials those are the things immediately later on if there is a tumor that comes back or residual tumor you can either repeat surgery or you can use radiation surgery surgery reducer or you can use Avastin. So this is the approach that the clinicians use with whatever is left after initial treatment. So these are the most important things that we are supposed to do you know, to, uh, about tumors before we talk about tumors. The most important thing that I want to, you to take back from this lecture is the five molecular markers, uh, IDH, uh, uh, P53, co-deletion, and NGMT, hypermethylated, and ATRX having a good prognosis, TERT having a poor prognosis, that, and that alkylating agents use methylation as DNA harmful, uh, I mean, harming the DNA so that we can kill the tumor cells, um, and that keeping in mind that Avastin makes perfusion imaging uh, poor after treatment with that, or unreliable, and the fact that you have to keep in mind about pseudo response that the tumor is actually growing and uh, not actually treated in a patient with avastin so these four or five things you have to keep in mind if you are actually involved in tumor treatment thank you very much